When was the last time you felt inspired? Are you ready to take your passions to make a difference while living a life you truly love? Your host, Katana Abbott, who is a life and legacy wealth coach and certified financial planner, searches the world to bring you experts in the field of personal and professional growth, wealth creation, and mind, body, and spirit. So grab a cup of coffee and take that quantum leap you've been waiting for. Smart Women Talk Radio, the link to live with purpose, passion, and prosperity. Hello, everyone. This is Katana Abbott, and I want to welcome you to Smart Women Talk, where I search the world for smart women and a few good men, including best-selling authors, thought leaders, and change agents who are on that leading edge. So our topics include things like money, business, health, inspiration, and the metaphysical. Today, I am interviewing nutritional therapist and quantum energy healer, Dr. Mark Mincola, about the way of miracles. So we're going to talk about how anyone can create miracles in their lives. We'll talk about the connection between food, emotion, and disease and the infinite field of untapped quantum potential. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our our guest. I'm really thrilled because our entire theme this month is miracles. And we we love to finish the year with something very positive. So Dr. Mincola is PhD. He is a nutritional therapist and quantum energy healer who has transformed the lives of more than 60,000 people over the last 35 years. Through his innovative genius, he has integrated ancient Chinese energy healing techniques with cutting edge nutritional science in what he calls electromagnetic testing, electro muscle, electromagnetic muscle testing. Dr. Mancola was recorded was awarded the um, 2021 Divine Contribution to Humanity Award with his new film, The Way of Miracles. And it was also awarded the Best Health Awareness Film in 2021. He has authored seven best-selling books and has appeared on Dr. Oz, Better TV, and numerous national and TV radio sh- and radio shows. So welcome, Dr. Mencola. Thank you so Welcome much for having me. <laughs> Thank you. It's, yeah, it's exciting to have here. You know, before we started, I mentioned to you, I had um, just watched your film and it really was exciting to hear how you have combined um, all this energy work with food and health. Can you tell us a little bit of um, usually how did you get started in this? How did you fall into this field? Was it an accident or was it something that you were drawn to? Actually, my, my older brother at the time when I was in college, I was 22 years old. I was a senior in college. And my, my older brother at age 35 had unfortunately suffered a heart attack. And that was a shocking experience for me. I, I absolutely couldn't couldn't get my wrap my head around that at all. I was, I was stunned and completely dismayed about the whole thing. So what I ended up doing was switching my major from business at the time to nutrition. And I started to really work hard at trying to help my brother as he was going through this, this horrible problem. And he had, a, had open heart surgery at age 35. It was a horrible situation. But it was all dietary. You know, even the, even the physicians back then knew that it was dietary in nature. And there was a lot of problems with triglycerides and his, his blood was elevated with triglycerides, cholesterol, all that kind of stuff. So I decided I was going to try to help him. And I, I switched my major and just started to really study. I was at every reference for library I could get, get, get a hold of. And I was just studying continuously to try to try to make a difference and put a diet together for him and help him counsel him. But that was my life-changing moment. You know, that was something that was so important to me at that time. And that shit changed my whole direction, just like that. And so how is your brother now? Um, well, my brother, he passed away at age 53. So he, he suffered at 35, the heart attack, and he had the open heart surgery. And they, the, the physicians told him that they, they put a valve in that was actually just designed to last for 10 years, they said. They said, 10 years, we're going to have to redo this valve. My brother said, I'm not going back in there for that. I'm going to go until I stop going, and that will be the end of it. And he just chose the fates of living life you know, one, one day at a time and making the most out of his life experience, but he wasn't going to go through any more surgery. He just, it was too much for him. And he decided he was just going to let it ride. And he took care of himself, ate well, 
He exercised. He took perfect care of himself. And he, he basically did really well from 35 to 53. Wow. So he lived much longer than they ever expected. No question about that. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, you know, it seems like we always, uh, almost every single person who I've interviewed has had some kind of triggering event that has changed their life and brought them to their sure. life work. So um, I'm so happy you're here to, to share your information with us. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I want to understand what is this idea of super consciousness and um, how does this relate to making miracles in our lives? And yeah, what is I mean, it? For, for, for the better part of 35 years, I've worked with so many terminally ill patients I and mean, thousands of terminally ill patients who have recovered, who've had miracle recoveries, remarkable turnarounds that nobody could put their finger on, so to speak, from, from, a, from a traditional thought perspective. You know, there was something special going on. And, and in our work and in our facility, we see it every day. We see remarkable turnarounds daily. And it's been going on for three and a half decades and still going on every day. So I just got to thinking about it. I thought, you know, there's, there's something behind this. There's, there's a reason for it. There's a, there's a way to document this and analyze this in simple ways that can actually help the world to, to, to grow from what we've learned. We want to share with the world, you know, what we've learned. I mean, to, to, to take part in these wonderful, miraculous stories is in and of itself truly amazing. But I felt... I felt compelled to share with the world how these how these miracles could happen. How could people actually glean this information from us and to improve their life processes and their, their healing processes and all that sort of stuff. So I decided to try to break it down analytically. And I decided that super consciousness is, a com- is one of the primary common denominators. It's, it's a state of awareness that is higher than your mundane consciousness. So, you know, we, we live in the mundane consciousness every day, taking care of business, driving the kids to school, buying the groceries, paying the bills, and, and that's, that's daily life. But there's an exceptional component to our being. There's an exceptionalism within our, within our source, within our soul, within our deep inner self. We don't tend to use that often. We don't tend to tap into it all that often. It's my contention that when I look back over the, these experiences that I've had with patients, Every one of them who ever recovered from a terminally Ill, Ill condition or disease went deeper within themselves, went to these special places of consciousness, I call it super consciousness. They, they, they took the time to meditate very deeply, pray very deeply, uh, alter their, their perception of life by going deep within themselves and going to those special consciousness zones, those zones of awareness, where only in those zones can we produce miracles? You can't produce miracles in the mundane self. It's, it's, there's an identity crisis here. You know, in other words, we think of ourselves as pure mechanistic personalities, you know, egos, personalities that are material, that are mechanical, cells, tissues, organs, organisms. And we're thinking in those terms. I say when you think deeper about yourself and you identify with yourself, when you, I, I one of the sections of the book, the way a miracles book, I tell patients, it's a beautiful thing to do this. Look in the mirror, go right to the nearest mirror. Look in the nearest mirror. The center of your eyes connect with the center of your eyes, eye to eye. Look in your mirror and just feel the presence of your spirit. Feel, feel the essence of your being, the essence of your being. Then the, then the goal is to become that, not just to observe it, become it. To become that which you're viewing, that is, that is, that is pure essence, source, soul, whatever you want to call it. But it's it's a it's a different identity connection than, than most of us are accustomed to. Most of us think of ourselves again as personalities, egos, um, names, faces, uh, titles, uh, mothers, fathers, whatever the title may be, president, vice president of the the, the, of the junk that we work or something like that. But again, I think that we're looking deeper within our source at at the real deep connection of our eternal self, our eternal being. And I think to make that connection with that eternal being is to is to enter into the realm where miracles are. Miracles aren't miracles are not in the mundane realm. You can't make them there. You, you got to go deeper. And when you go deeper, you're in the you're in the place where they happen quite readily. Yeah. Well, this morning you were you were talking about moving into that realm. And this morning um, I did a meditation, and I. I had um, music playing that had binaural beats and, um, you know, um, 
um, alpha waves and this gorgeous music. And it was about 15 minutes of just the music. And I'd started because I heard, you know, you do this in the movie, you talk about this idea of gratitude. I always start in gratitude. And, um, and I just, you know, got so excited while I was doing my gratitude. And then I did my ask. And then I, you know, did my thank you. And then I was just silent. And all of a sudden, I saw all these blue and yellow lights that were just coming and swirling and, and surrounding me. And, and I really was, it felt like I was in a different place, but I was, you know, being blessed. Now, I, I know that you know what I'm talking about, because I'm not, I've never really understood what that is. But it seems like I entered something different, because it wasn't just darkness, it was a loving presence that I felt. Yeah, so I think it, it begins from the, the perspective that everything is energy, everything is energy. So we come from a culture and a world that thinks everything is material. Everything is cellular. So we start, we, our concept of life begins at the cellular level. And in point of fact, everything is energy. Everything is energy. So um, when you think about what Werner Heisenberg, who won the Nobel Prize in physics in 1937, Werner Heisenberg, Dr. Werner Heisenberg told us that everything in the universe is 99.999% energy and 0.000% matter. So we look at we look at a world, we look at our life, we look at ourselves, our families, our homes, we see matter. Yet what we're looking at, unbeknownst to us, is representative of 000.001%. That's that's as far as that matter goes. So we need to understand and appreciate, if not learn how to maneuver within the context of energy. Everything is energy. 99.99% energy. So we are energy. Everything that we're about is energy. And I think that the objective is what you're talking about in, in your, your, your vision this morning, actually, meditation, is representative of swirls of energy, some remarkable energies that are surrounding you, that are within you. And those energies are reactive and responding to your energy output. So the energy that you put out is the energy that comes back. You're putting out a lot of love energy, a lot of higher, higher frequency, high vibrational energy. That's how you're getting all these beautiful colors and swirls and stuff like that. And I think you're, you're, you're putting it out there and you're getting back what you're putting out simple terms. You know, and it was interesting because I um, was creating like a big bubble of pink light and I was um, thinking about all my loved ones and then my friends and then my clients and then our community. And I think that's what happened. I, I um, put my energy out to all these people that I know and bless them. And, um, and then I, you know, I, and I was just so grateful for everyone. And then that experience started happening. So, you know, and I was creating intentions. So I think, per, was I perhaps in, in some kind of miracle field or miracle zone, as Marcy calls it, where Sneak. those intentions would even be stronger because I could raise my vibration like that? You're absolutely 100% correct. That's exactly what, what's going on there. I think that when we when we you conceptualize what's happening, it's it's a matter of elevating. You you said the word frequency vibration, energy ops, op, op manifests at a variety of different vibrational frequencies. So some some energy pulses really high, vibrates really high, some really low. And when you talk about the, the human mind, the the inner being of, of ourself, it's energetically attuned to work at very high levels or very low levels. So you take things like Theta brain waves, delta brain waves, alpha brain waves, those are very low frequencies, like three to five hertz, three to seven hertz, three to eight hertz, very low frequency. And the lower the frequency, the higher the amplitude. That's an interesting concept in energy. The lower the frequency, the higher the amplitude. So, in other words, what that's saying is the, the more you calm yourself, the more energy you put out there. So it's the opposite effect of, in the material, the material world that we, we're thinking of. You know, so in the material world, you don't you don't get anything stirred up unless you really put out a lot, put a lot of energy into it. But in the energetic world, the more you, the more calm, the less you do, the more, the more you have access to, to generating. Like the amplitude, the amplitude is considerably higher. So what you're, you're talking about here is you're talking about going into meditative states uh, like delta brainwaves, theta brainwaves. And it's kind of interesting. If you, they, they, they've proven that when you go into like delta brainwave states, four, four cycles per second, four hertz, four cycles per second, which is really low. The amplitude can shoot up really high. And it's really interesting if you talked about binaural beats, listening to binaural beats. Listen to this. If you if you meditate in delta in delta state, you produce four cycles per second. That slows you way down and increases the amplitude response. 
But if you if you do that delta meditation with music, delta meditation with music or, or binaural beats, you move into what's called gamma bursts. Gamma bursts are like 40 cycles per second. So you're going from four to 40 cycles per second in an instant. Now, you know what gamma bursts are all about? They're all about genius. They're all about Einstein. They're all about becoming tuned into virtually everything. You, there's, there's no answers that elude you. You don't mention that evade you, rather. So there's no, there's no limit to what you can do in, in gamma burst states. So again, I, I'll say this again. You relax in the deepest delta state, four cycles per second. That low frequency just mellows you right out. Calm as can be. Like a deep meditative, half-asleep kind of calmness, but you're in trance, more of a trance. Then from that trance state, if you're listening to binaural beats in your meditation, it shifts you. It'll shift you instantaneously from four cycles to 40 cycles. And those are called gamma bursts. And gamma bursts, like I said, that's, that's the magic. That's the ultimate magic. So that, that's, the accept, that's accessible for everybody. Meditate with music or meditate with meditate deeply, trance, trance deeply with um, binaural beats or meditative music. And you'll take right off. You know, it's interesting because um, we have this prosperity prayer that I've had my clients, I've been recording their voice saying the prosperity prayer, and we've put it with music um, from Steve G. Jones. He's got these, you know, the licensed music I bought, which has alpha, delta, or theta, and beta. No, it doesn't have beta. But anyway, um, I gave it to one of my clients who was having nightmares. And she said that she's listening to the Delta prayer before bed and she's having better sleep and the nightmares have gone. So is, is that part, is that because would that have helped her? You really, you know, listening to the, to the Delta with the binaural beats in a prosperity. Yeah, there, there are, there are different portals, portals. In other words, in the mind, the mind can actually access these, these windows and doors in dimensional context. So we don't realize it, but we're living in a dimension that is that is surrounded by a plurality of other dimensions. So we can actually access those other dimensions through portals, doors and windows that are, that are energy doors, energy windows. And like you say, when you go into delta or theta or even alpha, alpha is more of a meditative state, theta is a deep sleep state, and delta is more of a trance state. These are deep relaxation states. But by going into these deep relaxation states, and like I said a minute ago, lowering your frequency, lowering your vibrational frequency, the amplitude goes up, which basically means that you have access to all kinds of different portals that you can actually take your take your journey in, if you will. And you can journey through these different portals, and you can open up tremendous amounts of wisdom, energy that that you can't get in this in the, in this in the in the, in the worldly plane. You know, the worldly plane doesn't have access to that stuff. You go into these higher realms, these higher zones of frequency. You can pick up information that is limitless, absolutely limitless. And, and you know, something here's the other interesting thing. People do this all the time and don't know they're doing it. So, you, you know, so we, we, you can take an approach to consciously, like reading, reading the way of miracles, doing the exercises, doing your meditative work, doing your, your trance work. You can actually plan on doing that stuff and then accessing these great portals and, and accessing limitlessness, if you will. So you can plan on, on accessing limitlessness, but you don't have to. Some people just don't, aren't, aren't aware of the fact that they just go into those higher realms. And they, they, they just, they, they, there's something called astral projection. There's a religion called Ekankar. Ekankar has been around for a long time. Paul Twitchell used to be the, the, the head of Ekankar. And he, he talked extensively about how you close your eyes, you close your inner, close off into your inner being, go deep into your inner being, and you'll travel. You will travel. Your soul does the traveling. So where a lot of people just call it, that's just imagination. I close my eyes and I, I'm imagining that I'm flying above the clouds. No, you're, you're not imagining it. According to people like Paul Twitchell, according to a lot of people who understand this stuff, you're traveling. You're really astrally traveling. You're, mo- you're moving outside your mind, outside your, again, think, think of it, your mind is, is not local. Your body's local. Your mind is, is non-local. So you can go anywhere you want in the universe. You know, Bill Buman, I think his name is, has a book called Adventures Beyond the Body. That's right. Yeah. And I was reading that and he mentioned he's, he, his first time he came out of his body, he saw a man with dark hair, um, trimmed beard, dark flashing eyes and a purple robe in his room looking at him and it freaked sure. him out. And he went back into his body. And another time he saw him in the garden and he talked to him and I knew who it was, even though he didn't, it was Rebazar Taras. 
because I've studied Ekin yeah. Carr for years. Yeah, and yeah. so that that was so amazing that he's writing about something he doesn't know, but then I recognized it myself. And then later, he, I don't think he ever really mentioned who it was, just an ascended master or something. But we, so we all can go into other dimensions and to, and go to the same place is what you're saying? No question about that. Absolutely true. But I mean, keep something in mind. We're accustomed to thinking in terms of matter where things are limited. I mean, you, you can only go so far. You can only travel, you can only drive 55 miles an hour to go from here to Worcester or whatever. I think, you know, you're, everything is limited in time and space, but we're talking about other realms beyond the material realm. So we're talking about realms where there's no limitation. There's, there's no limitation by time and space, none. So, I mean, you, you can, you can, you can go to, they say there are 18 universes and we're told that there are currently 18 universes. So my, my contention is, I mean, if you're going at the speed of light, think about this, the vastness of space, you can travel the speed of light with like 600,000 miles an hour or something like that. So you're traveling at the speed of light and you go to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, it's four light years away. So at the speed of light, it takes you four years to get to the nearest star. That's that's how vast the universe is. So when you think about other universes, 18 universes, it's just beyond your comprehension to grasp. But but your mind, your, your, your inner being, your soul, your spirit, your essence, your invisible self, if you will, has access to all this and can get there in a timeless instant. In a timeless instant. So you can travel 18 universes in a timeless instant. And the, 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 the contrast between our, our material self and our energy self is so dramatically different. That's why I say we're, the first thing we need to do is overcome our identity crisis. We have, I say the first, the only sin, the only sin in my mind is self-contempt, self-contempt. And the only reason we have self-contempt is because we think we're just what we are in the material world and we're not. So we think we're just the, the loser, the sinner, the the the, the, the incomplete being, the, the the mistake maker. Who could love that? Nobody. So that, that's where self-contempt comes from. And in point of fact, we have no limit. Because we have we have a higher self. We have a we have a limitless self. Again, this, this an inner being self that can actually travel 18 universes in, in, in an instant. That part of us is easy to love. That part of us is so representative of our limitless potential, our limitless capability. So I think we need to first tackle the identity crisis. Mm -hmm. I, I, the term I use in my book is called identify your I. We use the word I 500 times a day in word, written, conversation. But who, who is that? Who is your I? Have you identified your I? Have you identified the core I, the source, the, the eternal self? The, you know, when you're looking in the mirror, like I said, in, in eye to eye, you feel the essence of which you are. You, you sense the essence, the, the soul. But there's no limit to that being. It's just an energetic observer. You're looking in the eyes of yourself in the mirror, and you're observing the observer, if you will. And, and observing the observer is a beginning process to, to solving, to resolving your identity crisis, becoming real, getting real. And getting real within the context of your limitless potential. It's beautiful. So do you see some type of transition or awakening happening on the planet right now? Um, I, you know, I see it from the work I'm doing. I'm helping women 55 plus, you know, figure out who they are, why they're here and looking at their second and third acts, you know, at 50 and 60, they're finally able to do what they truly came here to be. And so right. there's all this talk about purpose, purpose, right? What's my purpose? Is this all part of our awakening? And what advice can you give to people that are looking for their purpose? Because what you're talking about, we have so much more potential than we can even imagine. <laughs> Well, that's that's the key, and that's why I say the identity crisis needs to be resolved first and foremost. And I think that the important part of that is to realize that that's why we're here. That's why we have. That's why you have consciousness. You know, consciousness is what we are. Con you don't have consciousness; you are consciousness. And to develop the conscious being that you are is why you're here. Is why you have. It's why you have awareness. It's why you have the ability to to be aware of your consciousness. Having conscious, being consciousness is one thing, but to, to be able to be aware of what you are at, at the moment that you're that is really truly incredible. So, I mean, I think the objective is to is to embrace uh, and to learn and to grow within the within the context of your internal source, your soul, your eternal self, the, your eternal traveler, the observer. I think when you when you start to identify with, with that part of your being as it is. That's when you are left with no 
limitations. You, you don't, you're not bogged down by limitations of time and space. There is no time and space when you're in spirit, when you're in soul, when you're purely conscious. Now, that's the beautiful part about that experience. And yes, I think that to find that we have no limitation to discover that is really a truly beautiful discovery. But you, you have to get accustomed to being who you are first. So you have to tap into and emanate from, that's the important way I refer to it, you know, to, to look in the mirror again and see your, see, feel your soul is one thing, to emanate from your soul is another thing altogether. That's the key. Yeah, and, you, and I noticed in the movie you talked about um, we are constantly sending, our thoughts are constantly going out, right? Yep. And, yep. and our, so people are like feeling our thoughts even if we're not speaking. Yes, so, there's no question. So we have to stay in this high vibration, right? Yes, yes. And I think that when you, when you think about nonverbal communication, uh, we all engage in nonverbal communication all the time. I mean, you'll see somebody on the street from time to time and you just have a pleasant thought about them or a, a concept that comes to mind about them, you know, a thought. And, and you might even kind of put those thoughts into circulation like you just talked about a minute ago, project the thoughts. And other people in, in, that we pass by are going to receive those thoughts. They're going to they're grasp them as well. So there's, there's constant, constantly transmission and reception going on at a nonverbal level. That's, that's what energy is all about. So a vast majority of our of our daily life is about nonverbal communication. It's about the energy exchange between energy beings. And that's exactly what our real life is about. And I think the other part about that is that the truth that's, that's embedded in that is unmistakably perfect. The truth that's embedded in, in the concept of energy that's, that's nonverbal communicative is perfect. It's absolutely perfect. It doesn't require any ego observations, doesn't require any editing, doesn't require any redos. It's just straight up the way it is. So for, for all of our listeners who, you know, we're, a lot of, there's a lot of difficult things going on in the planet. And our theme this month is miracles. Your book is the miracles, is it miracles way. Did I get that right? The, the, way, the way of miracles. The way of miracles. I'm sorry. Okay. And, and so can we share like an exercise or a tip um, that, our, that our listeners can do here, you know, during the holidays to manifest miracles, to, to um, help their loved ones, and also to maybe um, send love out into the planet? What are some things we can do? Well, one of them we mentioned earlier, just to, to find the nearest mirror and uh, eyeball to eyeball yourself in the mirror. And just to observe your, your observer self, so to speak. So you're observing the observer. And I think when you observe the observer, you're, 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 you're overcoming the identity crisis that we keep talking about. You're, you're, you're clearing the path to become the soul that you're observing. And that's, uh, that's the important thing. That's probably the most important exercise of all. There's another exercise. Where you can actually take your two pointer fingers. You can put both your pointer fingers right, right at your heart. So just both, both, point, both point of fingers right at the heart like that. And then you close your eyes and you take one deep inhalation and envision that you're actually breathing with your heart. You're not breathing with your lungs, you're breathing with your heart. So you take a deep inhale. But again, the breath is being, being prompted by the heart. And then you're exhaling, exhaling through the mouth. Three deep breaths. The second one, again, envision that your heart is doing your breathing. Picture your heart being like your lungs. And then exhale through the mouth. Third and final breath. Exhale through the mouth. But the whole point of that is to envision in your mind, in your mind's eye, that your heart is doing the breathing. You're not, you're not breathing through your lungs, you're breathing through your heart. So it's, it's, it's an energetic exercise that actually strengthens the heart chakra. And the heart chakra is actually the key, in my opinion, for being able to, to trans. Transmit energy that are the highest of the highest type, the highest kind, and to be able to travel the universe energetically at will, and to access portals like we're talking about. I think the, the key to that is actually breathe, doing the heart breath. So those, those are called the heart, taking the heart breaths. So that was um, what I started the Year of Miracles course, uh, Marcy's course, at the beginning of the year. And one of my intentions um, was to be able to travel to altered realities on command. And I mean, that's like a really big idea. Listen, listen, you already, you already do that. The, 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 the question is whether you're aware of the fact that you're doing it when you're doing it. Like you talked about a few minutes ago when you saw those colors after your meditation, those yeah. swirls, you were there. 
But the, the thing is, we don't have enough reference. We don't, you know, if we grew up in the, in the ancient Taoist culture or something like that, in the, in the Ayurvedic cultures, we, we'd have reference for that stuff. We, we come from material, the ultimate material world, material culture. So we don't have access to, to deciphering this, to understand this, to comprehending it, to being aware of it when we're there. Again, we, we write it off, as I said in the book, we write it off as imagination. That's just imagination. It's not just imagination. Uh, you're, you're there. But you, you don't have the reference to, 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 to reinforce that concept. Wow. <laughs> and, and then I have another question for you. Um, I'm sure you, you have um, an idea for this, but um, I noticed like I wear um, the, the Garmin, you know, wrist thing and, and it tracks my sleep and it shows my beta, my deep sleep, my um, light sleep, you know, um, and I have more light sleep than anything. But I have a question when, when we dream and we're in REM, um, does our body somehow par get paralyzed because um, our soul is actually leaving our body? And why is it sometimes we'll wake up in the middle of the night and we can't move, we're paralyzed? Do you, do you know that answer? <laughs> yeah, the, the answer is you, you're, you're shifting your energy field. You know, so in other words, the rooting, the grounding of your energy is moving into the astral realm. So when you sleep, you're not, you're not actively using your physical body. So your physical body hands everything over to your astral body. In your, your catheric body, so your catheric body, and your astral body, your your, your invisible bodies, your, your your energy energy bodies, if you will. So your energy bodies are receiving all the energy in those zones, and at those times of night, your physical body doesn't get that stuff. The minute you close your eyes and you start moving into, um, you move past beta brain waves. You mentioned beta earlier. Beta is actually the the, the stress state, the active state, the the the, the push state. The, the active, the most active stress state, beta. So when you drop, when you drop the beta brain waves and you start moving into alpha, which is more relaxation, then you move in deeper into delta, and then moving into theta. And theta, you're, you're, there's no energy being generated to the physical cells at all per se. Physical cells are just regenerating, recharging. They're not activated. They're, they're not activated at all in the theta state. Theta state, you're recharging your cathartic and your astral realms. Your 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 non your non seeing un, invisible bodies your 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 energy bodies if you will are getting loaded up at that time and they're they're, they're that's, that's where all the energy goes so it takes a while to make that adjustment when you first wake up in the morning to go back in the physical form from the astral from the cathar. So when we're sleeping, we're actually healing all parts of us. That's correct. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, then talk to us a little bit about um, how most people today are so stressed and anxious and. Walking around, you know, and we're all multitasking. Go, go, go! Um, how is that affecting our our bodies and in our emotions? Living in a constant state of stress, because I noticed in the movie, it seems like a lot of people that you were helping heal um, had chronic stress that um, may have been part of the disease, not just food. Because I would like you to talk about, you know, the chronic stress and the food, um, what we can do for ourselves, but mainly right now about stress, because this has been stressful. Sure, 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 of course. Well, I mean, I think that, that to begin with, let's, let's assert that disease begins with dis-ease. So when your spirit is ill at ease, that's the beginning process of breakdown. And I think that the important factor is to understand that your adrenal glands, your fight or flight organ, your, I should say, fight or, fight or flight glands produce uh, 45 hormones, 45 different hormones that are mobilizing hormones that help you run out of a fiery building, help you fight for your life, help you run for your life. So that's designed, those, those 45 hormones are designed specifically for the purpose of fight or flight survival. They're not, you know, there's, there's two aspects. There's survival, there's prosperity. So our bodies and our minds are either in a prosperity mode or a survival mode. When you're in survival. You're talking about like 45 hormones that are just designed to gear us up to run faster, jump higher, um, and to fight stronger and all that. So I think that that's not a, ha that's not a happy project. Uh, that's, that's a survival picture that we're trying to paint. That's exactly what it is. Purely survival. Not pros There's no prosperity in survival. And to be in an intensely sur survival challenge state, as it were, is to drain every cell in your body. I mean, any, anybody's had any period of any intensive period of stress, they get wiped out. You get tired, you get exhausted, you get drained, you get depleted. And ironically, you think you sleep really well, but you don't. 
you actually sleep restlessly because your your mind and your body is still active. They're still putting out fires. They're still anticipating running for your life, competing, uh, performing, et cetera, et cetera. So this this is a, there's the stress is all about competing and performing. There's 45 hormones that activate that gear us up. And I always say that there's two nervous systems: efficiency and emergency. Efficiency and emergency. So efficiency is when you're in a relaxed state, meditate, you do tai chi, yoga, whatever. Calm your body, calm your mind. You take that test, you're going to do so well because you're, you're calm, you're collected, your your resources are accessible to you. But if you're in a if you're in a stressful state, forget about it. So there's efficiency and emergency. If you're in an emergency state, you you don't produce efficiency. You're in a state of survival, like I said earlier. So stress is all about survival and emergency. And you know, research indicates a lot of the, the anthropological researchers indicate that our bodies, the human body is designed to be in a state of stress 15% of its lifetime. 15%. Now, do you know anybody that's feeling stressed? 15%. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it just doesn't doesn't work that way anymore. So we're we're overshooting the boundaries there. You know, we're we're tapping ourselves, draining ourselves through stress far greater than we're, than we're than we're designed to contend with. So what are what's the solution for for going back to being stressed out only fifteen percent of the time? I mean, can is there something we can do to reduce the stress? I mean, because a lot of people don't have it. Well, they think they don't have a choice, but. Do you have some suggestions, some tips for us how to reduce stress and live in, in a miracle field? Yeah, it goes back to what we said earlier. I mean, I think that if you take the time to uh, re-identify yourself for a start, that's the beginning point, re-identification of self. You are not what you think you are. You're not limited. You're not restricted. You're not, um, you're not victimized. By your by your stress chemistry, etc. You know, you 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 can choose to be victimized. You can choose to be limited. You can choose to be stuck with this problematic aspect of life called stress, or you can choose to be liberated. So I think it depends on what you choose to begin with. I'm going to choose myself that is not. You know, I always say the, the key to that process is conscious, um, conscious, um, proactive thought process, to be consciously proactive, not to be unconsciously reactive. That's the key. Think about, think about the number of times in your life you've been unconsciously reactive, unconsciously reactive. Mm-hmm. Emotional stuff, you know, somebody bullying you or giving you a hard time, you, you react, 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 react. Consciously proactive, not unconsciously reactive. That's the key. So to dedicate yourself to being consciously proactive is to create this, this, this state of relaxation at a deep level because of the, because of the perfection that it renders, because of the limitlessness that it offers, because of the truth of self that it represents. So it's reprogramming, it's reformatting. And I think the way you reformat that beyond the the identification process is to exercise it, to, to, to do your trance exercises routinely, to do your meditations routinely, to to do your meditations with music, do your meditations with binaural beats, you move into gamma bursts. So, I mean, those are the ways that the book talks about. There's wonderful ways you can work with your mind and your spirit at elevating your game of life. Yeah, Holosync is one of those companies, the very first one I heard of. Yes, that's right. The Holosync technology. Well, let's talk a little bit, um, you know, everyone's been eating, you know, Thanksgiving turkey and parties and, you know, lots of drinking probably at these parties. Um, what can, because I noticed um, in the movie while I was watching, you help these people transform their health through food. I'd love for you to talk about food right now um, and what role that plays in healing. And, you know, how important is it to watch what you put in your mouth? Because I was kind of surprised uh, with some of the recommendation of things that we think are healthy. And a, a lot of times you've had to take those things out of the diet. For people and then they healed. Yeah. First of all, food is medicine to me. Number one, food is the first medicine. Long before there were there were any prescriptive drugs or anything like that, people were working on food and supplementation with herbs and things like that. So I think number one, food is medicine. Number two, um, we need to realize that everything is energy. Like we said, you're made up of energy. You're comprised of pure energy. Your whole being is energetically based. No different with food. The foods that you choose to eat 
the beverages you choose to drink are all energy based too. So we can look at food and nutrition at a, at a biochemical level, at a material level, or you can look at an energetic level. I look at it at an energetic level. So one of the things we do, so we actually do a lot of muscle testing. I developed a system of muscle testing. Patients raise up their arms, we check their strength. It's it's not a it's not a it's not a fight. It's not a strength game. It's just a it's just a, a simple dowsing process. So you take different foods, wheat, dairy, tomatoes, uh, green beans, whatever, and you you check the resistance for them. And then I then I believe we need to pulse them, not just check what I call pass fail. Like did the green beans pass or did they fail? But you can actually pulse them. How how good are the green beans? The green beans pass. Let's check one to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, pretty strong. Six out of 10 is pretty strong. So we, we do a numerical evaluation by pulsing the energy field. So it's, it's, this is your mind at work. This is your mind, at your, your higher mind at conceptualizing intention, putting forth intention and drawing answers from your intentions, talking to the energy that's present and the patients you're working with and getting a response. So we check all their foods. And when we check other foods, we're doing a bio-individualized process. Not everybody does well the same thing. Everybody's different. Everybody's totally unique. So we check the energy field of everybody and how their, their nutrition works out. Doing it for 37 years. And then when they pass a certain food, that's the food that they need. We circle that on their program charts. The foods that didn't pass, we cross out. So we put a meal plan together for them. So at breakfast, you have this, this, this. Lunch, you have this, this, this. And they're designed to, to play off of those foods that passed energetically. And again, you're testing that person and that person alone for their unique energetic responses. That's, that's very powerful. And that's what enables us the opportunity to be so successful at helping them recover because you're checking them at an energetic level, which is as subtle as it gets. Number one. Number two, you're bioindividualizing it, which is them and only them. One size doesn't fit all, you know? So to take the time to do that, it's quite important. It's quite an exercise and it's quite telling as well. So we do that. And then we put people on supplements with the same thought in mind. You begin with empirical evaluation. This person with migraine headaches does good with fish oils. Let's, let's check them for fish oils. How many capsules a day? One, two, one, two, three, whatever the milligrams. We actually test it all. So the whole process is energetically laid out, mapped out, and they get specific individualized programs that are energetically tuned and they're, they're remarkably amazing. And, I, and over the years, I've gotten really pretty adept at doing it, pretty tuned into it. And it's, it's, it's incredible. Is Food science... Is is science starting to understand this work or are they still um, You know, there's, there's a researcher named Leesman, Leesman, back in 1980. He was the first person that actually did this. He, he studied what I just talked about, muscle testing of foods. And then he actually ran blood tests, like on 100 different foods. And Leesman decided that he was going to compare the muscle testing to the blood test. And he found that actually it was 98 something 98.2% accurate. So, I mean, that, that, that was, that was done at the behavior, the Institute, Institute of Behavioral Kinesiology in like 1980, 1981, early 80s. But I think that there's a lot of people that, that have studied it at this point. A lot of people have done a lot of analytical work with it and stuff like that. But I always felt pure and simple. I'm going to do the work, see what happens. I mean, I've been able to help thousands of people and. But are the doctors um, knocking at your door? The scientists and um, doctors are saying, what the heck is going on here? You know what? I got news for you. There's a lot of doctors and scientists in the greater Boston area. We got a lot of incredible hospitals, Children's Hospital, Mass General Hospital, Dana-Farber, all that stuff. They send me people. They don't have, they, they, I've, years ago, I had a physician come to see me. He books an appointment like at nine o'clock at night. He said, a couple quick things. Don't ever call me at work. Don't explain what you're doing. Just do it. <laughs> yeah, I know a couple of people that do um, the testing with one guy has a machine from from Germany that was like from like the 1940s or something yeah, with probes yeah. that he hooks up and then he, he's doing the muscle testing, but he's doing it with these little vials. So yeah. I know there are there are people that are, are doing this kind of work and it's too bad we we can't combine the allopathic and, and the holistic here in the United States. I think, I think it's happening more. I think that it's beginning to happen. I mean, I, have a, I know a lot of physicians actually that, that do the work. I had a couple of them study with me briefly over the years. Yeah. But there's, yeah. there's, there's, it's starting to happen a little bit more. So if people want to learn more about your book, 
about your film. And I have to say the film is interesting because you had people like Deepak Chopra and um, Bruce Lipton and some, I mean, some really, really interesting people um, in your film. Can you tell us about how we can learn more about your film and watch it and, and, and your book and just learn about you? Sure. I mean, for starters, you, you, can, you can go to um, thewayofmiracles.com thewayofmiracles.com and you can access the film you can watch the film on that that access thewayofmiracles.com the other thing you can do is go to my my website markmincola at gmail.com markmincola m-i-n-c-o-l-l-a 12 l-l-a at gmail.com um those are probably the quickest way to get in, to get into the process also the book is available the, the way of miracles book is available at, at beyond words publishing or at amazon.com so pretty easy to tap in, but um, the book and the film are slightly different. You know, we, we made it a point not to make the, the book and the film identical. So we have different different case studies in the book and the film. And I the, the book begins actually with, with a miracle that I went through in the process. So we start with my miracle in the, in the book, which is pretty powerful. Because mm -hmm. I, I went through a difficult time. You know, here I was pr producing a, a miracle making book and film about patients who experienced remarkable turnarounds, miracle turnarounds. And I was bit by a Lyme tick and I actually had Lyme disease and I was paralyzed for three weeks. And I was told by physicians that I wouldn't walk again. I'd never walk again. So I've completely recovered from that. But that was my miracle. So we taught, we start off the, the book with my miracle. And it's in the film too, but it didn't begin in the film, it begins in the book. So do you have groups that are joining together now to practice some of these things from your book? Some of the yeah, exercises? We're, we're, yeah, we're starting to put some things together for um, for further education, you know, to, to help other online professionals and people like that to tap in and to actually, we've had a lot of requests. I, I talked to Christine, the producer, last week. She said they're getting deluges of people who want to know the system and want to study the system. And so we're, we're trying to work, we're developing the academic component of it as we go along. Oh, that's pretty exciting. So do you have any final thoughts before we wrap? Because we're at the top of the hour and um, I, we've covered a lot, you know, but um, is there anything job. else you want to make sure we cover? Um, I think that this is the most important message that i like to emphasize. This book and this film, The Way of Miracles, are really designed to awaken people to themselves, to awaken the public to the special soul that they are. To the, to, the, to the power that they have, to the limitless power that they have, to the limitless capability that, are, that they have access to. They just have to tap in to, the, to the, the, the core self, to tap into the source. The power of your source needs to be discovered by your awareness, by your consciousness. When your consciousness taps into the, the power of your source, your life is going to change radically and miracles will be available to you um, at, at your whim. No question about it. So we really can create miracles and live in no the question about it. We do it every day and we've been doing it for 37 years. I'm just sharing in the, in the reality and the process of it. And that's, that's, that's what the book and the film are about. That's wonderful. Well, it'll make a great holiday gift, great holiday viewing. <laughs> so I thank you so much for being here with us, Dr. Mincola. Such a pleasure. I appreciate you inviting me. Thank you so much. It's been very rich. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone, if you want to join us, just go to joinsmartwomen.com. You'll get on our mailing list. You'll know who our guests are, and you'll be able to access the Smart Women Academy with all the different free courses that are there for you. So until our next show, go out and live with more purpose, passion, and prosperity. Thank you for joining us here at Smart Women Talk Radio, a place to learn, prosper, and grow. Tune in again next week for another exciting episode of Smart Women on the CTR Network. And remember to live with purpose, passion, and prosperity.